Meet Daryl Havens. As a teenager, Daryl was a skilled car thief. That is, until a dramatic police ambush left him permanently paralyzed from the neck down. After the injury, Daryl was no longer a danger to society. But he received a prison sentence of 20 years. Do you know how much it costs to incarcerate someone like Daryl? It's about $200,000 for each year of his sentence, times 20 years is $4 million. That's four million taxpayer dollars to incarcerate a man who's never going to walk again, let alone steal a car. Is this a wise use of our resources? Imagine how else you could spend four million dollars. How many at-risk youth you could send to college. Turns out it's in the hundreds. But this story is not just about Daryl. About one-third of the people in the U.S. correctional system are folks who given the right kind of treatment and support, will not, in fact, go on to reoffend and become a danger to society. So if we could provide the... if we could predict who's actually dangerous, then we could use our limited resources to provide the right kind of care to the right people. Our communities would become safer. We all win. But how the heck can we predict who's going to be dangerous? Well, I'm a cognitive scientist, and that's the question that drives me. So together with a team of nationally distinguished scholars, especially from the Mind Research Network here in New Mexico, and with the invaluable support of the MacArthur Foundation, we've sought some answers. So tonight I'd like to share with you what I've learned on this journey, both in how a better understanding of the mind and brain can help us identify new ways of predicting and managing problem behavior, and how we as voters and taxpayers can build safer, healthier communities by investing in evidence-based justice policies. Okay, but can we actually use science to predict who's going to reoffend? Well, many courts, it turns out, already try because they have to make difficult decisions every day about who to incarcerate, who to treat, who to release. And unfortunately, the accuracy of these tools that they use to make their predictions is fairly limited which means that dangerous individuals are being released into the communities, non-dangerous ones are being retained, hardly anyone's getting the treatment appropriate to their risk level, and we taxpayers are paying for these missteps. Now, to their credit, these courts often rely on established risk factors, information about the offender's criminal history, lifestyle, and mental health, like whether or not you have problems with impulse control. But there's one thing that all these tools ignore. It's the information processing system that enables all of these important experiences. Your brain. So if we could capture how the brain behaves while we're, say, acting impulsively, then in theory it should be possible to predict who's at greatest risk. Now, actually put, putting such a theory to the test would be no simple task. You'd have to scan the brains of about a hundred consenting inmates, and since you can't exactly bring them out of prison for a brain scan, you'd have to find a way to bring a 30,000-pound scanner to them. Then once scanned, you'd have to wait for them to get released from prison, and they, then wait for half, that, half of them to reoffend. Only then could you test your ability to predict those reoffenses from the initial brain scans. Now, all that might sound like a lot of work. And my wife will tell you about all the dinner parties that she had to attend without me because her husband was in prison. <laughs> but four years and a couple of headaches later, we did it. So what did we find? Well, we found that a region of the brain known as the cingulate cortex was telling us something interesting. We found that the people whose cingulate cortex was highly engaged highly active during their scan session, well, over the course of four years, they were only half as likely to get rearrested as those with low cingulate activity. Now, this may not actually be such a coincidence because the cingulate cortex is known to be heavily involved in the ability to control your impulses. 
So what we believe is going on is that people who are better able to control their impulses, as reflected in their brain function, are relatively protected from reoffending. Now we also asked a second question, which is how well can we predict those reoffenses? And here's where things get really interesting. Because we found that for about 80 out of the 100 offenders that we scanned, we could correctly predict which ones would ultimately reoffend just by looking at their brain in action. Now, mind you, this is a good 10% more accurate than many of the methods traditionally used by courts to assess risk. So these findings raise the possibility of improving upon existing measures by harnessing the power of the brain to shape behavior. Now, that sounds lovely, but shouldn't we be worried that authorities are going to use this kind of technology to read our minds and lock us up before we've done anything wrong? I mean, that's what the science fiction movies have all been warning us about, right? But how worried should we really be? Well, you can rest assured that the research I presented to you tonight is still very much in its early stages. It's just a proof of concept certainly not ready for application. But I think that's exactly the point, because as the science develops, we need to be able to anticipate its potential uses and misuses. And the fact is that many courts today are already using risk assessment technologies to justify incarcerating offenders for periods far beyond their completed prison term. It's called involuntary civil commitment. And it removes the offender's basic freedoms on the probability that they might still be dangerous. So given that courts are already using such risk assessment technologies to make these kinds of decisions, are we not permitted, perhaps even obligated, to strive to do better? See, the more we can draw upon good science to inform our justice decisions, the better we can address the unique needs of individual offenders. Research has shown that when we tailor our treatment programs to offenders' unique needs, they do better. And when they do better, our communities do better. So what have we learned? Well, first I think we've learned that the people who make up our justice system face a daunting task, because they have to make these difficult decisions every day that trade off between this person's safety and that person's freedom. They shouldn't have to do that alone. They can't just rely on us scientists because science is just a tool, one that can be used for good or bad. So we need your help as responsible citizens and voters to help us identify how we can best leverage the scientific evidence to make smarter justice decisions, because ultimately, evidence-based justice policy is really our best hope for keeping our communities both safe and free. Now, we've also learned that a better understanding of the brain can potentially help us to better understand our own behavior. Now, does this mean we're hardwired for bad behavior? Well, to the contrary. See, people, much like our brains, are changing dynamic systems. So what if instead of locking people up at every impulse, we invest in that change? What if we took all the money that was wasted on Daryl Havens and all the money that's being spent right now on hundreds of thousands of low-risk offenders, and we use that to invest in our communities. Job training, education, treatment, community building. As voters, this is your hard-earned money at work. How will you spend it? <laughs>